Today I'm going to talk about successful prevention and promotion programs. When I say successful, I mean programs which are cost effective and feasible both. After I finish my lecture, you will be in a position to understand the standards for prevention and preventive programs. You will also learn various types of preventive programs which are there in the community. You will learn to identify the effectiveness of such preventive programs and compute their cost effectiveness and feasibility. You will also be able to analyze the overall success of such programs. So let us begin. The Standards Working Group reviewed the literature on effective prevention programs from multiple fields including child welfare, public health, juvenile justice, substance abuse and mental health. Martin Bloom in 1996 defines prevention as coordinated actions seeking to prevent predictable problems, to protect existing states of health and health functioning and to promote desired potentialities in individuals and groups in their physical and socio-cultural setting over time. Although Bloom views promotion of well-being as an aspect of prevention, others have made a distinction between treatment, prevention and promotion service models. Prevention definitions and programs have evolved from traditional treatment approaches which attempt to remedy a problem by focusing on the deficits, the weaknesses and characteristics of the target population or its environment that needs to be changed. However, many professionals involved in prevention have moved towards a strengths-based approach, building on the assets and positive characteristics in the target population or environment that could be enhanced. This approach has become known as promotion. So if we talk about the operating system, we have to go stepwise. The first step is to get started, followed by getting organized, then developing a profile, creating a plan, and finally implementation and evaluation. Let's talk about the standards for prevention programs. It is important to understand that prevention planning and implementation require numerous coordinated methods and approaches, not just the programs. A comprehensive prevention plan would include changing laws, conducting media campaigns, mobilizing communities, and using formal and informal settings and approaches that are not only necessarily considered to be programs. We have to be disseminating information and increasing awareness, offering prevention education to teach uh, specific skills. Then we have to offer alternate drug-free activities, identifying early signs of abuse and offering referrals and counseling organizing the community and enhancing its ability to address substance abuse with community-based interventions and finally using environmental approaches that address standards, codes and laws in the community or in the state. As the standards working group began to look at specific types of programs, it became quite apparent that it would be an overwhelming task to review each type of program across multiple factors. The working group concluded that it did not have the time nor the resources to conduct a thorough analysis of program models. For example, examining parenting education programs would require looking at many different models that target different age and ethnic groups address different child development stages, vary in approaches, intensity and duration and purpose. Different outcomes, for example, the change in self-esteem and personal functioning of the parent, change in parent-child interactions, 
change in the family's need for outside social support or change in the ability to manage the stresses. What exactly are successful programs? Community and preventive psychologists have learned a great deal about the art and science of implementing preventive efforts. The challenge can be likened to the difference between reviewing for a test in the library and actually taking the test or the difference between pitching in the bullpen and facing live batteries uh, batters in a stadium with a huge crowd roaring on every pitch. Performance in the practice situation does not always match what can be demonstrated under the real world conditions. These challenges are made clear in a study that I am going to tell you which investigated the effectiveness of community based substance abuse preventive programs. In 2005, a group of researchers published a meta-analysis of results from 46 drug prevention programs funded by the U.S. Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration is the agency within the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services that leads public health efforts to advance behavioral health of the nation. SAMHSA as it is known, its mission is to reduce the impact of substance abuse and mental illness in American communities. A wide variety of programs were involved, but all were focused on the prevention of child and adolescent substance abuse and all targeted high-risk youth. Some programs focused on in-class instruction about substance abuse. Others were designed to teach children specific skills such as how to refuse offers of drugs and alcohol and still others were recreation oriented. The evaluations covered a total of five years over 46 sites around the United States. The meta-analysis included the computation of effect size, a statistics that in most cases ranges from 0 to 1. The results were extremely disappointing. The mean effect size over all the sizes was only 0 0.02, almost 0. Even more discouraging, at 21 of the 46 sites, the effect sizes were negative, indicating that the comparison groups demonstrated less substance abuse than the participant groups after the intervention. Moving on to social and emotional learning program. Social and emotional learning program called the SEL programs are school based programs designed to foster social and emotional learning in children. The programs are based on research demonstrating that academic progress is supported by positive emotional development. In fact, academic progress is almost impossible to achieve for most children in settings that are characterized by aggression, incivility and impulsive destructive behaviors. The research also reflects that positive social and emotional behavior is based on a specific set of skills which can be taught to children and which can be supported through directed school-wide organizational change. A wide variety of SEL programs are available. Most of these programs are directed at the classroom level, although many have components that extend to various other aspects of the school environment. Virtually, all the most successful programs focus on building student skills in key areas. Their components and procedures have been carefully studied and identified. The Collaborative for Academic, Social and Emotional Learning, 
CASEL as it is known was established to promote the adoption of SEL programs from preschool through high school. CASEL provides extensive resources to help in the adoption of SEL programs at the organizations. Next, I'm going to talk about human visiting programs. Human visiting programs involve having a trained staff person visit pregnant and new mothers in their homes. Generally, the programs are intensive involving weekly to monthly visits for up to two to five years. Visits focus on providing parenting information and support for the mothers. The goals of the program are to support healthy child development, increase positive parenting and parent-child interactions, and prevent child mal maltreatment. Home visiting programs are extremely popular. The programs exist in 40 states and provide services to about 2% of all children under 6 and their families in the United States. The programs also exist in many other countries. Two recent reviews give good overviews of these programs, including programs throughout the United States, New Zealand, Australia, and Netherlands. Moving on to community-based crime prevention programs. Community-based crime prevention programs include those that operate within the community and involve community residents' activity, working with their local government agencies, to address issues contributing to crime, delinquency and disorder. Community members are encouraged to play key roles in problem identification and pl planning solutions to problems in their communities. There is a wide variation in community-based crime prevention programs based on factors such as program focus, program rationale, community context, that is, for example, racial and social class composition in the community and the level and type of community involvement. Community-based crime prevention programs are operated by neighborhood residents, police and faith-based organizations. Community-based crime prevention programs covered here include number one, community policing a policing approach that promotes and supports strategies to address crime-related problems through police-community partnerships. Secondly, Neighborhood Watch, a community mobilization strategy in which citizen groups organize to prevent and report neighborhood crime and disorder. Thirdly, Comprehensive Programs, programs such as Weed and Seed and comprehensive communities promote the involvement of local and state governments, the private sector and the neighborhoods to respond to violent crime and drug abuse and improve the quality of life in communities by incorporating multiple approaches. And finally, ad hoc law enforcement activities related to crime prevention. The next program that I'm going to talk about is the Substance Abuse Prevention Program. The Substance Abuse Prevention Program, also known as SAPP, is an academic training program that provides coursework in the areas of alcohol and other drug prevention interventions, treatment and recovery, as well as related topics. The typical SAPP instructor has extensive applied experience working with clients, organizations and communities. Most hold advanced degrees and certifications or licenses in their area of expertise. Students, professionals and community members may take SAPP courses to broaden their knowledge base earn college credit or complete an area of concentration in SAPP. 
SAPP offers the coursework required to pursue the Oregon Certified Prevention Specialist, that is the CPS, and the Oregon Certified Alcohol and Drug Counselor, CADC, credentials through the Addiction Counselor Certification Board of Oregon. SAPP also offers community practicum placements where students can apply the skills learned in SAPP classes through supervised hands-on experiences. The next program that I'm going to talk about is the Diabetes Prevention Programs, also called the DPP. The Diabetes Prevention Program was a major multi-center clinical research study aimed at discovering whether modest weight control through dietary changes and increased physical activity or treatment with the oral diabetes drug metformin, which is called the glucophage, could prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in study participants. At the beginning of the DPP, participants were all overweight and had, had blood glucose, also called the blood sugar levels, much higher than the normal but not high enough for a diagnosis of diabetes, a condition called prediabetes. The DBP found that participants who lost a modest amount of weight through dietary changes and increased physical activity sharply reduced their chances of developing diabetes. Taking metformin also reduced risk, although less dramatically. Type 2 diabetes is a disorder that affects the way the body uses digested food for growth and energy. Normally, the food one eats is broken down into glucose, a form of sugar. The glucose then passes into the bloodstream where it is used by the cells for growth and energy. For glucose to reach the cells, however, Insulin must be present. Insulin is a hormone produced by the pancreas, a fist-sized gland behind the stomach. Most people with type 2 diabetes have two problems. Number one is insulin resistance, which is a condition in which muscle, liver and fat cells do not use the insulin properly and reduced insulin production by the pancreas results. Further, as a result of this, the glucose builds up in the blood, overflows with the urine and passes out of the body, never fulfilling its role as the body's main source of fuel. About 23.6 million people in the United States have diabetes. And right now, India is leading in the cases of diabetes all over the world. Of these uh, 23.6 million people in the United States, 17.9 million are diagnosed and 5.7 million are undiagnosed. 90 to 95 percent of people with diabetes have type 2 diabetes. Diabetes is the main cause of kidney failure, limb amputation, and new onset blindness in American adults. People with diabetes are more likely than people without diabetes to develop and die from diseases of the heart and blood vessels called cardiovascular diseases. Adults with diabetes have heart disease death rates about two to four times higher than adults without diabetes. And the risk for stroke is two to four times higher among people with diabetes. Talking about pre-diabetes, which is a condition in which blood glucose levels are higher than normal, but not high enough for a, diagnos a diagnosis of diabetes. Pre-diabetes is also called impaired glucose tolerance or IGT or also impaired fasting glucose 
IFG depending on the test used to measure blood glucose levels. Having pre-diabetics put one at a higher risk for developing type 2 diabetes. People with pre-diabetes are also at increased risk for developing cardiovascular diseases. Pre-diabetes is becoming very common all over the world. The US Department of Health and Human Service estimates that about 1 in 4 US adults aged between 20 years or older or 57 million people had pre-diabetes in 2007. Those with pre-diabetes are likely to develop type 2 diabetes within 10 years unless they take steps to prevent or delay diabetes. The DPP's results indicates that millions of high-risk people can delay or avoid developing type 2 diabetes by losing weight through regular physical activity and a diet low in fat and calories. Weight loss and physical activity lower the risk of diabetes by improving the body's ability to use insulin and process glucose. The DPP also suggests that metformin can help delay the onset of diabetes. Participants in the lifestyle intervention group, those receiving intensive individual counseling and motivational support on effective diet, exercise and behavior modification reduced their risk of developing diabetes by almost 58% which I think is very significant. These findings were true across all participating ethnic groups and both for men as well as women. Lifestyle changes worked particularly well for participants aged 60 and older, reducing their risk by almost 71%. About 5% of the lifestyle intervention groups developing diabetes each year during the study period compared with 11% of those in the placebo group. Participants taking metformin reduced their risk of developing diabetes by 31%. Metformin was effective for both men and women. but it was least effective in people aged 45 and older. Metformin is found to be most effective in people uh, between 25 to 44 years of age and in those with a body mass index of 35 or higher, meaning they were at least 60 pounds overweight. About 7.8% of metformin group developed diabetes each year during the study compared to 11% of the groups receiving the placebo. Let me summarize what I have taught you today. Martin Bloom in 1996 defines prevention as coordinated actions seeking to prevent predictable problems to protect existing states of health and health functioning and to promote desired potentialities in individuals and groups in their physical and socio-cultural setting over time. Socio-emotional learning also known as SEL programs are actually school-based programs designed to foster social and emotional learning in children. The programs are based on research demonstrating that academic progress is supported by positive emotional development. There are various people working towards the prevention programs. Some programs are from multiple, uh, multiple fields including the child welfare, public health, juvenile justice, substance abuse and mental health. The Substance Abuse Prevention Program, also known as SAPP, 
is an academic training program that provides coursework in the areas of alcohol and other drug prevention, intervention, treatment and recovery as well as related topics. The Diabetes Prevention Program, also known as DPP, was a major multicenter clinical research study aimed at discovering whether modest weight loss during dietary changes and uh, through increased physical activity or treatment with oral diabetes drug called metformin could prevent or delay the onset of type 2 diabetes in study participants. It is important to understand that prevention planning and implementation requires numerous coordinated methods and approaches, not just programs. There are various preventive programs such as crime-based uh, prevention, prevention from diabetes, home visiting programs, etc.